Okay, we're recording. Great. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Um, you are attending the Preparing Your Finances for a Potential Disaster webinar uh, presented by the University of Minnesota Extension Department of Family, Health, and Wellbeing. If you need closed captioning today, uh, you can find that on the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, you can find that closed captioning button. If you don't see that, look for that button with the three dots that says more. Um, and then once you find that, it, it can, you can toggle on and off the, the closed captioning. So we just want to make sure that folks have that if, if they need that. Again, my name is Sarah Kreimans, and I'm an extension educator with the University of Minnesota Extension. And I'm located in Morris at our extension regional office there. And I'm happy to be with you all today. In addition, Lauren Backus is with us, um, and she is serving as our webinar producer, managing the recording, and, and um, she will be putting the evaluation link in the, the chat at the end, and she's going to help me monitor the, the chat as well throughout the webinar. If you have any tech questions, feel free to send a private message or just a message in the, the chat and Lauren will be able to assist with that. So thanks Lauren for, for being with us today. So for those of you that were on a few minutes early, I had this screen up and, and I was asking for folks to share, where are you joining from today? And what is most challenging as you think about preparing your finances for a disaster? Um, so go ahead, if you haven't had an opportunity, put, put responses to those in the chat. Um, folks have responded previously. Um, lack of money um, to save. Where do you find that extra money? Yeah, knowing what things will cost in the future. How much to save. Yep, all big challenges. You know, thinking about the potential for a disaster. Yeah, to actually make money obsolete. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I'm going to wait just a few more seconds here. Yeah, Debbie, you know, being able to spare money on a monthly basis for savings. Yeah. So thinking about that. Someone's looking for planning purposes. All right. All great, all great comments. Well, we're going to move ahead. Um, and actually, I meant to delete the slide and I didn't. September is National Preparedness Month. So we are well ahead of preparing for that. And since we're sitting here in July, um, but we're going to go over several strategies to help you think about how to manage your finances in, pre in preparation for a potential disaster. And, and we're in that case where we hope for the best and plan for the worst or plan as best as we can so that we're better off if something does happen. So typically when we talk about um, preparing for a disaster. We probably think about an emergency reserve kit. And, and in this tub, you can see uh, flashlights and some food and, and I believe some band-aids and, and there is a, an envelope in there. I'm not quite sure what, what that is. And having a preparedness kit such as this is really important, right? But that's not what we're gonna talk about today. Today, we're gonna focus on preparing your finances for a disaster um, and, and looking at this just a little bit differently. So again, looking at the benefits of preparing finances, and we're gonna look at some very specific strategies. So I'm gonna keep you all busy today in the chat, and um, I want you to find that, that chat bubble or your chat tool um, icon again, and share with me what are some potential disasters your family may experience? What, what are you thinking might happen? Car problems, okay, loss of a job, long power outages, medical, weather, environmental disasters, house fires, farm accidents, heat. Heat is a big one right now, Amy, right? We've been pretty cool this week. It was supposed to heat up again. Job loss, unexpected death, income loss. All right, all really good responses. 
And today we're going to be thinking a little bit more about natural disasters, maybe some man-made disasters. However, all of the strategies that we are talking about today fit all of the scenarios that you also um, put into the chat. Um, and, and some things we can plan a little bit better ahead for, others not so much. But we're going to be um, looking at these types um, of disasters. But also, you know, given our recent history, a pandemic could be listed as, as a disaster, you know, resulting in an interruption of income, a change of lifestyle, maybe increased expenses in a, in a variety of, of ways. Um, but also thinking about um, if there might be any events that are happening in our community that might require us to, to quickly leave our home. What might we need to, to do or have with us, um, such as uprisings, rebellions, demonstrations, that kind of thing. Also, a domestic abuse situation um, might be considered an, an event, of course, where, where someone may need to or choose to leave their home um, in a quick way. So the, the resources that we're looking at um, today will, will definitely help us look at that. So this is my go-to map, and I, I grabbed this updated one this morning, actually. Um, so this is data as of July 11th. So we're, um, <laughs> this is really, really new data and up-to-date data um, from the National Centers for Environmental Information. And so in 2023, as of July 11th, there have been 12 confirmed weather climate disaster events with losses exceeding $1 billion each um, here in the United States. These events have included one flood event, 10 severe storms, one winter storm event. And overall, these events resulted in the deaths of 100 people and had significant economic effects on the areas impacted. Um, and as we look at the map, I, we don't see any in Minnesota. We may have folks from other states. So they're, they're kind of grouped there in that, that um, Midwest area there. But when we look at history, um, the 1980 to 2022 annual average is 8.1 events. So um, back to 1980, um, 8.1 events. So we're up with that, uh, up from that with 12. But when they look at data from the most recent five years, so 2018 to 2022, the average is 18 events. So our number of um, huge dollar weather and climate disasters are increasing. And so for me, that, that makes me think about something may happen, right? The likelihood that something could happen is, is, is increasing. And, and so it's really good for us to, to think about what we can do. So I also like this map. Um, because it helps us just look at most frequent natural disasters in each county. And um, this is just for a, a real quick visual. So um, if you're from Minnesota, uh, we see flood and severe storms, right? If you're from other parts of the state, um, you can see by county, right, within your state, what's more likely um, to happen in your, your part of the nation. And so it's it's good to know what might happen, and and of course other things definitely could happen, um, but but this helps us narrow our our thinking about what kinds of disasters might impact us. So we're talking finances today, and um, several folks had had comments in the question in the chat about savings and lack of money to save. Um, in a, a recent study from 2019, they found that 69% of adults have set some money aside for an emergency. And about half of all adults have no more than $700 set aside for emergency. So half have 700 or no more than 700, right? Um, and the other half, right? Thinking about, about some folks do have dollars set aside and, and others don't. And so our goal is to, 
to do some planning so we do have a reserve um, in case we need that. So this was a, a study um, that FEMA did in 2021. And they looked at different actions people had taken um, related to preparedness. And they found that almost 60% of folks took three or more of these 12 preparedness actions and almost 90% took at least one. And so um, let's just run through these quick and, and you can do a, a quick check to see how many of the 12 um, you have in place currently. Uh, so 45% have assembled or updated supplies. So that would be that, that tote, that emergency kit that we looked at at the beginning. 27% um, have document and insurance property. Um, oh, they document and insure property. There we go. So they, they have an inventory and, and they have insurance on their property. Um, I would guess probably if we looked at the insurance on its own, that would be much higher, but but documenting um, inventories um, probably brings that down. 16% of folks are involved in their community around, I'm guessing, disaster pieces. 28% have thought about those evacuation routes. 43%, so less than half, have made a plan. 45% have made their home safer. 15% have planned with a neighbor. And when I think about my neighborhood, we, we um, live in the country in a rural area and many of our neighbors are elderly. And, and so uh, thinking that uh, if you have neighbors that, that might need assistance, um, it, it would be good to have those conversations. 22% have practiced emergency drills or habits. 34% have safeguarded documents. 44% have saved for a rainy day. 40% have signed up for alerts and warnings, and 25% have tested family members um, with a, a communication plan, or they've tested that to make sure that that works. And so uh, these 12 preparedness actions um, really help us think about things that, that we can do um, to get our family ready. So there are definitely benefits to being financially prepared. This is actually a, a picture from my driveway last spring and, and our uh, two of our dogs, I guess, um, two dogs. And um, this, this was a nasty, nasty storm that came into West Central Minnesota last spring. Um, major hail damage. Um, Thousands of homes in our community needed new shingles, new roofs, um, new siding. Um, and so um, I'm always looking towards that sky um, to see what might happen. So benefits of being financially prepared. Uh, it can definitely help us reduce fear and anxiety and gain a peace of mind, knowing we have a plan in place to, to manage our finances. Um, also, it can help protect you and, and your family and, and your future. And definitely, if something were to happen, if you are financially prepared, you're going to be better prepared to navigate the recovery process. You're going to um, be able to navigate that more effectively and efficiently and definitely have more options available during that recovery process. So another chat here. How can you financially protect your family from the impact of disasters? I wanted to have us all brainstorm a bit, and then we are going to jump into some strategies. So please share in the chat how you and your family um, can manage your finances to, to um, protect against the impact of those disasters. Thank you, Ethan. Okay, multiple streams of income. So if something happens to one, great. Build up the disaster emergency fund. Yeah, be a diligent saver. A readily available emergency um, savings covering a certain amount of number of months of expenses. Becky, yep, we'll be talking about how many months. Cheryl, having cash on hand, yep, yep. All very good, good strategies. 
Thank you, Amy. Um, Self-sufficiency, I installed solar panels last fall, life insurance policies, oh, buffer funds, okay. So you call your, your emergency funds, perhaps buffer funds, and, and you're looking at a certain amount per person. Um, Stephanie, yeah, being more involved in the community so that there's that built-in protection when we face that larger disaster. Um, having that community support is so important. And Melissa, the diversification, have cash, have electronic money, right? All right, all really good suggestions. And, and we're going to walk through several here. So the first uh, strategy is to create and use a spending plan or a budget, right? We want to have balanced income and expenses. Uh, we want to mindfully prepare for preparedness. Um, so make sure we, um, if possible, we're contributing to our emergency fund. Are we setting aside for, for different things? Um, and you'll see a little bit later, we'll be talking about insurance and, and other things, um, you know, diversifying the, the management strategies and tools and several people mentioned that as well. Um, using direct deposit is really helpful. Being comfortable with online banking or mobile banking is also helpful because it will allow you to to manage and access funds in, in a variety of ways. Um, I think about my mom who um, is almost 80 in the fall, she'll be 80. She doesn't do online banking. Um, she doesn't have a debit card. She uses checks, right? So very old school and, and um, at this point in her life, not willing to, to try some new things. But if, if folks are open to some of those um, electronic management tools, um, that, that may make it easier in the future. And so again, when we're thinking about creating and using that spending plan, you know, balancing that income and expenses, ideally living below our means, right? So we're, we're allowing or freeing up some dollars that we can use um, to set aside for, for potential disasters. This was a big one that was mentioned multiple times in the, the, the chat, an emergency fund. All right, so ideally, we would have three to six months worth of expenses set aside. Um, so if we experience an interruption of income, we, we have three to six months um, to get back on our feet. Um, definitely, for, for many of us, it's, it's hard to save that much, and it's not going to happen overnight. And so building a little bit into every month's spending plan to set aside um, is a good idea, all right? When we think about emergency funds, we need to have those dollars accessible. So if something does happen and we need to get, get a hold of those dollars pretty quickly, um, we don't want them wrapped up in a, a complex investment um, tool um, that, that would take a bit to get a hold of. Um, and we typically think about emergency funds for unexpected expenses. Um, when I work with folks on, on the budget or the spending plan, I really like to do set asides for the things that we, we know will happen for those expected expenses. So um, getting that new set of tires, right? We know those tires are going are, are gonna to break down or they're, they're going to need to be replaced at some point, right? So setting aside for car maintenance and repair. For those of you that are homeowners, and typically our home is our, our biggest investment, and, and so setting aside for home maintenance and repairs is really a good idea outside of our emergency fund. So if the water heater dies or, or um, I have to call in a plumber, right, I've got dollars set aside for those home um, maintenance and, and repair sorts of things. Um, other things might be set asides for, for holidays and gift giving. It might be setting aside for, for back to school expenses. It might be setting aside dollars to meet the deductible on my health insurance policy, right? So when I think of an emergency fund, and everyone can define an emergency fund um, how they want to, but I think of an emergency fund 
is if there's an interruption of income, right? My, my, my source of income has been paused or it goes away, right? And I need to scramble to get back on my feet. Um, and so it might be hours cut back um, at my place of, of work. Um, maybe I lose my job. Um, I do some financial counseling with gamblers at a residential gambling treatment program. So for many of the, the gamblers that I meet with, they, they are there without pay for, for a month. Some of them may have some short-term disability or, or other resources to assist with that, but it's an interruption of income. All right, so develop that emergency fund. So several people had asked in the chatters or indicated that finding that money can be really challenging. So let's brainstorm for a few minutes in the chat on where would you find money to start or enhance your emergency fund? Go ahead and share your thoughts in the chat. All right, Amanda, yeah, decrease monthly expenses. Becky, any excess from budgeted monthly expenses. Yep. Yeah. So if there's there's some extra dollars, good ideas. Um, sell unneeded items. Yeah, Melanie, right? Have a rummage sale, sell something on the local marketplace online, right? Look at, at ways you might be able to sell some unneeded items and that helps reduce clutter, which is a, a benefit in itself. Amy, having that second job, right? A, a, a side gig that, that can help generate extra money um, for those things. Um, Melissa, look at the budget and be hard-nosed about what's really necessary versus what feels necessary, but maybe isn't. Going back to those wants versus needs. Ethan, yeah, he uses a second job strictly for disposable cash, then use salary to set aside. Okay, all right. All very good ideas. I'm gonna scroll down here. There's a few others. Yeah, audit subscriptions, get rid of those that you don't need, assess wants and needs. Um, Jessica, congratulations on recently canceling services that you don't use regularly. Um, uh, Teresa, determine those spending triggers um, so it's easier to reduce expenses. And Rick, for me, it would come from cutting down and dining out. I know, right? It's so easy to go eat out, but we can uh, make meals so much less less uh, cheaper at, at home for sure. Amy, again, looking at some of those extras, right? Um, can we look at some of those subscriptions, eat out less often? Um, definitely. Oh, Lauren, thanks for adding that. Tuck away gifted funds. Um, use the Get Upside Down app huh, and tuck those funds away. All right. So, you know, anytime you get a gift or a tax refund, those would all be great places to, to you know, if you don't want to set aside the whole amount, um, at least a portion of it. Um, all excellent ideas. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, yeah. Okay, let's move on to the next one here. Having cash on hand reserve. So um, financial institutions may be closed if, if a disaster happens, right? If a flood comes through or if a tornado comes through or, uh, you know, you name it. So if, if financial institutions are closed, we may not have access to funds in our accounts um, in, in a quick manner. Also, there may be power outages that uh, may cause credit cards and, and ATMs inoperable. So it is suggested to have some cash on hand, which would allow you to, to get the things that you would need in the case of an emergency, right? If you needed to get gas, if you needed to um, purchase some food or, or those types of things. Um, and so, how much money should folks have? You know, that that's a really good question. Um, I would start with, with $200 maybe. That, that's not hard at all, but two to 500 maybe. You know, if you think about um, not being able to go to the bank to get money for, 
for a couple days or four days or a week, how much money would you need to purchase um, some groceries and some gas and, and um, other sorts of things? Um, also, when we think about um, these, these dollars that we have, you're going to want to keep them in a safe place and you're going to have to decide what, what safe means to you in your home, right? In a place that that isn't accessible to others, that others don't know where it is. Um, ideally, um, the, the money that you would keep at, uh, at home, the cash on hand reserve, would be smaller bills. Um, I always do better saving when I have larger bills, but in the case of a, a disaster, um, stores may not be able to break a $100 bill. So it's probably better to, to have um, smaller bills on hand. Um, and again, there's no hard and fast rule on how much um, you should have available. So think about your situation and, and what you think you might need um, if a disaster were to, to strike for, and you wouldn't have access for a few days. All right. The next recommendation is for folks to review their credit report, right? So it's important to know what your credit report is. Um, says it's important to know what your score is. And once you know that, then you can take action to, to correct um, items that, that maybe need to be addressed. Um, so if you have um, a larger amount of outstanding debt than you're comfortable with, then you can start thinking about how can I start paying down that debt, right? Which would um, improve my score, make my, my credit history um, more attractive. Um, so definitely um, look at ways um, to build or maintain that credit history. Um, we have had webinars in the past on credit reports and scores. Um, MyFICO.com has lots of really great strategies to help folks when you think about um, trying to build or improve your, your credit history. Now you'll see the URL at the bottom, www.annualcreditreport.com. This is the government approved place for all of us to go to receive a free copy of our credit report from each of the three main credit bureaus on an annual basis. So by going here, you'll be able to request reports from Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. So all three, and again, request those, take a look at what it says um, and figure out if, if there's any strategies, any steps that you can take to, to improve your, your credit history. The next strategy is to determine your debt to net income ratio, all right? So it helps us look at what, what's our current debt usage, Am I am I using? Do I do I have too much debt out there? And and then the second piece to that is what is your capacity to take on more debt? So if a disaster did happen, and let's say my car was was demolished, and and I um, only got so much from my insurance company, would I be able to take on another loan to replace that car if I needed to? Okay. So with the, the debt to net income ratio, and, and some lenders will use a debt to gross income ratio, we're using net, so take home um, pay here. So we're going to take monthly debt payments and divide that by monthly net income. Now, when you're looking at debt payments, um, you can include a variety of things, and we'll look at an example on the next slide here. Um, but when we do this formula, we want um, a 15% or less debt to net income ratio is, is ideal. And if, if your number is higher than that, definitely um, take some steps to reduce um, the debt. But I really want to emphasize the benefit piece in this blue box at the bottom, um, benefit to knowing your debt to net income ratio and, and having it at an acceptable level means you would have more likely to have access to credit if and when needed when a disaster strikes. Okay, so as I indicated, to do that debt to net income ratio, you take that monthly debt payments, um, divide that by the net income, and that'll give you the debt to net income ratio. So we have an example here. 
And you may be wondering, well, where, where is the mortgage or, or rent? And we don't consider that in our debt to net income ratio, but you will notice there is a home equity loan in there. So we would include that. Um, so in this scenario, the individual has a debt to net income ratio of 21%, which is higher um, than that, that ideal 15% or less. And so in this case, the individual uh, may want to take some steps to, to bring their ratio down. So they may want to um, do some power pain on some of those debts to get things paid off. All right. Okay, our next strategy is to develop that household inventory. And, and we alluded to that a little bit earlier. Um, but a household inventory will, will provide proof of possessions. Um, so if a disaster were to happen, it, it would be good to have that, that inventory. Um, I've heard stories of, of folks who have had fires or floods or tornadoes and, and they would need to document what was lost in that, that disaster in order to get um, insurance coverage for things. And so if you're able to do some of that work up front, um, that would be extremely helpful. This is also a, a good um, activity to do to help you determine what are your insurance needs. Um, maybe you have a, a a special collection of some sort and you decide, oh, maybe I should seek out, you know, extra insurance for those things. And definitely, again, following a, a disaster, you'd be able to use your household inventory for insurance assistance and, and tax purposes. So there is a URL here on the screen and I am going to be sending a follow up email um, with all of these URLs as well as a PDF of the PowerPoint slides so you'll have access to that. This is a super simple um, household inventory form you could easily do something on an Excel spreadsheet. Um, you can see in, uh, we're looking for what's the item, the manufacturer, the model, the serial number. So we do dig down on some very specific items. When was it purchased? What was the value new? What's the value now? And then this form was actually designed for, for after a disaster. And so that last column looks at, at damage incurred um, where you were, and you could add that um, when you pull out your inventory if a disaster does happen. Um, so for some people, this feels really overwhelming, and I get it, right, to develop a household inventory of everything in my house. Um, so I encourage folks to start with some of the, the larger ticket items, right? So maybe my electronics. Um, if you are a hunter or fisher um, person, and, and if you have expensive equipment, go ahead and, and document those. Um, having a video, perhaps using your phone to go around your house and and a videograph, you know, open up closets. I'm looking over at a closet here. Open up closets, open drawers, um, open up the cabinets so you can do a, a video. And so if later you need to develop or finish up that inventory with the smaller items, you would have that or using photographs. Now, um, we wouldn't want our paper inventory to, to get all mushy in a flood or to fly away in the tornado. And so it would be good to, to put that inventory in the cloud, have an electronic copy that you'd be able to access later. And maybe it would be, um, if you are not real techie, sharing a paper copy with a trusted um, family member. So there's a, a copy of your inventory offsite. But definitely having um, the video or photos um, would be really good um, to have. And again, starting with your, your bigger ticket items uh, would be a great place to start. Um, I've had some people share with me that, that they've decided to do a, a room a month, or maybe you want to do a room a week, right? And, and start, start compiling that. All right. We're going to shift gears here. We're going to start talking about insurance. So if you can share in the chat what types of insurance might be important as you prepare for potential disasters.
All right, flood insurance, flood, homeowners and renters. All very good recommendations. Ah, Kelly, ugh, septic insurance, no from experience. So Kelly, did you get a, a, a separate um, rider on your insurance? Um, I'd be curious yeah. if you put more yep, in the chat. Great. Because of the location of the house, the insurance agent suggested that we do that in three months or three years later than our basement flooded. Oh, nasty. Okay. Was that the, like the backup rider perhaps? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Great. Thanks, Kelly. Um, auto insurance. Oh, living expenses coverage. Renters or homeowners. Auto right? All really good recommendations. And it really depends again on what, um, what a person's situation is, right? That is going to dictate what your needs are. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. Autos in storage. Yes. For the winter. Um, Jessica, my son was deployed in 2022 and, um, he did the storage on his vehicle. Um, and, yeah, and actually it was sitting out at our place and it ended up with hail damage in that storm from that very first picture. Um, so he wasn't paying a whole lot for having it just parked, but it, it really paid. Life insurance as well, Lauren, just in case something happens. All great suggestions, thank you. And so when we think about coverage, right? First determine you know current coverage. What kind do you need? What kind do you currently have? Um, maybe having, and I would suggest having a conversation with your, your insurance agent um, because there might be things out there that, that might be beneficial for you that you're not aware of, such as in Kelly's situation with her septic. Um, assessing needs, right? Going back to that household inventory, talking with your agent, um, having those conversations. Um, if you have in your if your insurance agent is local, that that's really easy, right? Schedule an appointment. That's what they're there for. Go in and chat with him or her and and they can help you think about different things. If you do insurance um, online or through a company that's that's not local, definitely call and and request a, a review and a conversation as well. I think insurance is not always the easiest thing to understand. Um, and so do a little education. Learn what does the, the terminology mean? What, what are premiums? What are deductibles? Are there co-pays for things? Um, a variety, right? So learn that terminology. Also learn about how does that work. And sometimes I think we take for advantage that everybody knows how insurance works, right? I get a car, I buy insurance. If I have an accident, you know, what are the steps? I call the insurance agent, you know, and, and how does that claim get filed? And, and what are those steps? And that that's not intuitive, right? And so um, it is helpful to know what is that process for various types of insurance, whether it's my homeowners or renters, my car insurance, health insurance, um, and, and asking uh, the insurance agent, can you just describe how that would look if I needed to file a claim so that you know what that process is? And that can help uh, reduce some of that anxiety that, okay, I, I know what to do if something does happen. All right. I think about um, our our children that that we've been launching, and and um, for them, they they've never really had to deal with that. And and so, if you've got young folks in your house too, or have recently launched young young adults, help them understand what what that process looks like. And the last bullet here: identify changes as needed. So, um, are, are things changing? Right. Are you getting married? Are you getting divorced? Are you having children? Are you launching children? Are you acquiring assets that that might need might need extra coverage? Um, a, a coworker that I have lives on an acreage, and and they're they're investing in a, a small tractor for snow removal. Um, and it's um, more of a tractor than they've had in the past, and 
and ended up taking a loan out on it and they required insurance. And so my coworker called their insurance company and, and they found out that for them, it was covered under their homeowner's insurance. You know, good deal. Might not be the case for everyone. So if you're making purchases, um, check those things out. Um, yeah, so continually evaluate your insurance needs. Now, as I dug a little bit into the research here, um, 60 to 70% of disaster loss is uninsured. So even if we have insurance, there's a whole chunk of it that's not. Um, in 2017, 70% of overall Hurricane Matthew loss was uninsured. 36% um, of economic damages from Hurricanes Harvey, Irma, and Maria were uninsured. Um, lots of times people will say, well, I, I really don't need to worry about it because if something happens, if we have a flood or a tornado, FEMA is going to come in and, and take care of me. That's not always the case and probably not at the level um, we would all hope for. Um, in order for um, individual assistance to happen through FEMA, that requires a national disaster declaration. And so not every tornado, not every flood gets that national disaster declaration for FEMA to even come and, and um, to assist. Um, as I was updating my slides this morning too, I, I had that the maximum amount received for total uh, potential of receiving for total home damage is approximately 41,000 was the updated number I found for 2023. It had been at about 33,000. And FEMA assistance isn't always available and it can't make you whole again. Now, granted, there's other resources through the Small Business Administration, which sounds really bizarre that the SBA um, would be playing a role in disaster recovery, but they do have some, some resources available to help homeowners um, following a disaster. But again, know that um, insurance, if you have it, if you're lucky enough to have it, uh, that's great, but it doesn't cover anything. And I see um, Tressa, Teresa in the, the chat shared that she went through a flood and FEMA covered less than half, right? Um, so supplementing with insurance and, and other things, um, it really puts the responsibility back on us, right? To have that preparedness piece. So some insurance tips, and we could do a, a whole webinar on insurance, um, but we've got just a few slides here. So thinking about flood insurance, um, homeowners insurance policies do, does, do not cover flooding, right? So you need to have a, a special um, flood insurance policy. Um, and so you can definitely check with your, your insurance agents, um, check out those, those policies um, to see what might be available to you. If you have valuables, we talked about different collections or, or things that you might have, do you want extra coverage? If you've got jewelry or photography equipment or um, again, anything there, um, Think about extra coverage. Talk with your insurance agent about that. Kelly, this one's for you. The third bullet there, sewer backup coverage. So that, that sewer backup um, is not typically covered on a homeowner's policy. And, and so it requires an extra rider on your policy. And so um, if you're not sure that you're covered on that, I would call your insurance agent. Um, typically, it's not, you know, huge additional amount uh, with the premium, but I would check um, on that because that, um, that could be a really nasty situation and even nastier if you don't have resources to assist with the cleanup there. Also, we need to think about actual cash value versus replacement cost protection. So what, what kind of coverage do you have? Um, and as you look at your declaration pages from your insurance company, um, you, you should be able to tell that. If you can't, ask that question of your, your agent again. So actual cash value, right? So that is the value of the item right now, right? Looking at 
the item with depreciation. So let's say I, I had a, a disaster that came through a tornado, my refrigerator, you know, ended up two fields away. If I had actual cash value because my refrigerator was 10 years old, I'm not going to get much for it. But if I had replacement cost protection on my insurance, I could probably get a new refrigerator. Okay, so have that conversation again. It's so important to know what kind of coverage do you have and do you want or need to make some changes. Um, if others have suggestions um, around insurance, be sure to uh, throw those in the chat so, so others can see those as well. But I think um, it would be a great gift to yourself to schedule um, time to sit down and, and look again at what insurance do you have, what other types of in, needs do you have, and, and what types of insurance might be available, and then to schedule a time with your insurance agent to have those conversations. That's what they're there for. They are happy when people call and, and want to sit down and, and um, have those conversations to make sure that, that folks are in a good situation. All right, uh, this is a, a quick, quick graphic here from the National Flood Insurance Program. Just one inch of water can cost $25,000 of damage to your home. Um, and again, most homeowners insurance policies don't cover that flood damage. So they're encouraging folks again to, to think about, consider um, flood insurance. All right, our next strategy is to organize a grab and go file. If you remember back to one of those first photographs where we had the tote with our, our emergency kit, there was a, a manila folder in there. And I'm, I'm gonna assume that those were some of our, our important papers, right? And so if we do need to, to quickly leave our home, you know, the, the flooding's coming, we, we need to get out or um, maybe we, we want to make sure that we have our grab and go file in the basement when the tornado goes through, um, or if, if we need to, again, leave our home in a quick way um, for a variety of reasons. So gathering all of those important papers um, and, and information, right? Having them in a small binder, waterproof is, is a really good idea. Keeping it accessible um, so that you can quickly grab it. And we have more information on our website. But when we think about what, what are the things that, that we would want in there, right? So we would want copies of things that we might need to um, prove who we are, right? So we might want copies of driver's license, um, birth certificates, um, marriage license, some of those sorts of things. Um, when folks are having to deal with um, FEMA afterwards, they require two or three years of tax returns, right? So this is really important stuff that, that has a lot of personal, private information, right? So we're not going to put it in a waterproof container and have it sitting at the front door just in <laughs> case we have to dash out. And so it's probably good to to have it again stored in a safe place in your home that's not easily accessible, um, you know, where, where others might, might get to that. Um, but I will again include this link in our follow-up email so you can learn more about um, what might you put into that grab and go file. Now also, I'm talking about a paper format of this. Uh, you may want to develop a copy that, that goes in the cloud so you can access that um, electronically as well. All right, so I have a, a quick handout and this, this link will again be in our, our follow-up email, but it's got the, the 10 strategies, well actually nine strategies that, that we have talked about. Um, and this would serve as a great discussion piece. If you have a partner in life, you might want to grab this, this um, information sheet um, when I said the, the follow-up email and say, hey, I was on a webinar this week, and these are some of the things that we talked about. Where are we good? What, what areas can we check off? And, and what areas might we want to work on? And like with most things, we're probably not going to be able to do everything all at once. But um, having this quick visual reminder might help you think about, well, what's a priority for us right now? 
Um, what could we do easily, right? Maybe requesting that credit report would be an easy thing to do to get started with. Um, but um, use this as a conversation piece with, with your significant others, for sure. All right, just a few more slides here. And, and um, at the end, we will be sharing a link with the evaluation link. And um, from that, folks can get a certificate of participation. Or if you're a U of M employee, uh, you'll be able to use that link to, to access well-being points. But I wanted to spend just a moment to think about where can you seek assistance as you financially prepare for a disaster? Who can help you? If you can put some thoughts in the chat, that would be helpful for me. Who can help you with this journey? Housing counselors, oh, definitely, definitely. Um, many of our local community action programs have housing counselors. Insurance agents, Becky, yes, they're they're a given, right? I, you know, we we pay them a lot of money, right? So I would take advantage of their expertise connect with them. Sean, yes, your financial planner. Um, they can probably help you think about that emergency fund and set asides and, and how are we doing with, with just uh, the, the whole picture, thinking about um, risk management and all of that. I also like, Sean, that, that you've put clergy in there. Rick, thanks. Yes, extension, like the smiley face. We've got lots of resources and we'll have a slide with those as well. Um, Jennifer, yes, working with your family, right? So those that, that live in your home is supporting one another, that communication, but then also with extended family and, and maybe you have a, a challenge with family members that, that you're going to work through some of the strategies together and, and hold one another accountable. All really good ideas. So as Rick indicated, the University of Minnesota Extension, we've got lots of resources and you saw that in the previous slides, but this link will be in the follow-up email. But we've got information on creating that family plan, the inventory, that grab and go file, you know, thinking about reviewing insurance and the emergency fund. We've got some good tips for older adults. Um, and, and then some related to emergency food supply and, and cooking in a kitchen. So lots of great resources on this website. Also, FEMA um, has uh, many great resources as well. The one that I want to point out today is their EFAC, the Emergency Financial First Aid Kit. Um, and so this is a, a nice piece to to use to fill in um, your information, to collect information, get it all in one piece. This link again will be in the follow-up email. They do have this publication in multiple languages as well. So um, if, if you are seeking for yourself or maybe for clients, friends that you work with, um, they, they do have this in multiple languages. So that's extremely helpful. And then I also want to think about those other potential resources. And um, we have that faith-based organizations on there. Um, Sean had mentioned clergy, but the financial institutions, again, your insurance agents, those nonprofits, faith-based employee assistance programs um, would also be great. There's many players on that governmental agencies that, that help um, around uh, planning, preparedness, and of course, response after disaster. And then of course, mental health professionals. So recognizing that um, there, there may be a, a greater need for mental health services um, following the disaster, but even prior, um, definitely remember those folks as, as a potential partner. Um, ready.gov backslash plan has got lots of resources as well. This is um, from FEMA as well, but helping you think about preparing um, for a disaster is, is really important. So if folks have any questions, go ahead and, and put those, whoops, uh, put those in the, the chat. And here is the evaluation link. And Lauren is going to stick that one in the chat. And we will also include that in the follow-up email. But if you, um, please, we welcome feedback on, on the webinar and the content. If you have suggestions for other ideas, if you have recommendations for future topics, be sure to include that. And if you are seeking a certificate of participation, 
please, please um, do the evaluation and it will direct you on how to do that. And also if you are a U of M employee or spouse uh, using the U of M insurance and you're seeking those well-being points, um, the evaluation will drive you towards that. Now, please know that that um, points are applied to accounts, I believe once a month. So be, be patient as you watch for those points to show up. Um, so again, if anybody has any questions, um, put those in the chat. Um, I typically say with this presentation, the suggestions that I gave aren't like, um, totally earth shattering, right? There are things that we all probably already know um, that would be good steps, good strategies for us to follow up on, not only with benefits um, in, in the case of a potential disaster, but many of those strategies just really help our, our overall financial well-being. So, Sarah, yes. when they take the eval, can you tell them which um, session yes. this belongs in? Thank you, thank you, thank you. So one of the questions, first questions on the evaluation is which series does this belong in? And it belongs in the climate and disaster preparedness um, series. And so um, thank you, Lauren. I had that jotted on my notes here, but I didn't say that. Um, hopefully that's um, intuitive because the, the disaster is in the name of that series. So thank you. Lauren, let's just go ahead and stop the recording and then if folks have any additional questions.